uh, now we will go to our third uh, speaker, uh, Valerie. Valerie, right? Valerie, Valerie yes. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Valerie, Valerie uh, Schrumpler. Okay, so uh, she's a senior research uh, associate at Grisham College uh, in London, having studied at the uh, lots of University of Bristol, uh, Bristol, Manchester, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce this name um, correctly. Witwatersand. <laughs> It says Johannesburg. Uh, she has lectured at the published widely of the influence on astronomy and cosmology on art and architecture, particularly for Byzantine, medieval and the Renaissance periods. Uh, hello, uh, welcome with us hello. and the floor is yours. Okay, right. Well, I'll just share my screen. I hope this is going to work and do the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, well, I think, I think that's, um, that's okay now. Um, so firstly, I'd like to thank, uh, thank everybody for the invitation to attend this really important conference and um, to say good morning, afternoon or evening to, to all of you. I'm speaking to you from St Albans, which is about 25 miles north of London, where the stargazing is, as you can imagine, not, not terribly good. Um, but now I'm, I'm going to speak about something rather different from the previous talks we've had on biology, botany, education and design. I'm a historian and I'm interested in looking at the history of things and an art historical approach in particular to the problems that we're facing now. So just to begin with, um, I'd like to, to draw your attention to a quotation by Rolf Waldo Emerson in 1836, who observed that if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore? But every night come out the, the stars of beauty and light the universe with their admonishing smile. So in fact, um, it's, it's something that we're not used to anymore, but how amazing it would be if, if um, it, it only happened rarely. And of course it is becoming more rare. So as an overview, uh, just a minute, I'm trying to, I've got images covering over some of my text, but anyway, so I, I, my, my approach is that visual images of the sky or heavens are an essential backstory to the protection of the dark sky. The contemplation of stars and planets and the heavens have, have inspired myths, religions, philosophies and legends from the ancient Greeks and medieval Europe through to the, the Renaissance, the industrial age in our own time. And I'm going to be looking at the Milky Way as a, as a case study and looking at grasping the complexities of the universe and, and how this led to scientific theories. And yet science, it seems, with all this lighting and light pollution is actually re removing astronomical phenomena from common sight. So focusing on our galaxy, the Milky Way, um, some recent evidence shows that the Milky Way is no longer visible to a third of humanity, including 60% of Europeans and roughly 80% of Americans. And in fact, during a 1994 blackout, Los Angeles red residents called the 911 emergency number when they saw the Milky Way for the first time. A, a minor earth tremor had actually caused a blackout and they saw the Milky Way and, and it, it actually invoked fear and wonder and amazement. So the world population and light pollution um, is something that's, that's growing all the time. I've been looking at world population in relation to light pollution and I think there's a roughly a, a correlation between population increase and light pollution. But of course, light pollution um, matrices were only 
considered and, and formulated a few years ago. So I'm going to use population as a rough index, a rough correlation with light pollution. So on the left from the, this data um, program, you can see that um, the population has increased phenomenally in the last um, few decades and is now approaching about 8 billion. The most um, affected, an example here of the most affected area is, this is actually Monaco, which is the most densely populated area on the planet. It's less than one square mile, the most densely populated um, principality, because it is actually a, a nation in itself. It's less than one square mile and has a population of about 37,000 people. But if we look back um, at, the familiar, familiarity with the night sky, of course, has always been, been with us from when mankind start looking up at the sky and, and contemplating the universe. So some beautiful examples here of the sky goddess, in an Egyptian example, the sky goddess Newt, depicted as the Milky Way, or on the right hand side at the top here, you can see the sun, moon and stars um, on a boundary stone from Babylonia, which is 12th century BC. In ancient Greece, um, Plato observed in Timaeus, which is his, his work, which is, was the best, best known until the Renaissance and also involved with cosmology and the universe. And Plato writes that none of the accounts concerning the universe would have been given if, if men had not seen the stars or sun or heaven. I presume he meant women as well there, but, but the word is actually men. The vision of day and night and the months and years actually caused number, it caused clocks, it caused calendars and the notion of time and, and a means of researching into the nature of the universe. And you can tell by these images from um, ancient Greek vase painting um, here where we have the, a row of stars along the top of the vase in the example on the left or at the example on the right, the word at the top, Asteria, um, stars, she is the goddess of falling stars and night from the fifth century BC. So you can see how important the visions of the stars were. Now, as I mentioned, I'm correlating this to population. And here we can see, and I've used population education, the reference is given below here on Vimeo. And we can see an, an image of the population of, of the world from about the second century um, AD, Christian era. And here you can see the population around Europe, in China and Japan and India, and also in the Americas. But of course, these ancient settlements in Greece and Rome and the rush lights and torches and oil lamps would have had very little impact on the vision of the dark sky. The fact that it was familiar to everyone is, is demonstrated, for example, by this silver coin from the reign of the emperor, the Roman emperor Hadrian in the second century. And you can see here, that we have the seven sisters, the Pleiades, depicted on the coin, because it would have been familiar to every, everybody in a way that this perhaps is no longer. Moving on, by about the 10th century, um, and in the Norse medieval um, traditions, we can see how the um, images of the stars were related to the idea of the creation of the universe and how in this mythology, um, the body parts of a, of a slaughtered God were thrown into the sky to make the sun, moon, stars and planets, which compares in a way with the um, Judeo-Christian uh, account of the creation. So in the Judeo-Christian account, where we have a lot of examples in, um, in Europe, um, we have in from the book of Genesis, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, meaning the sun and the lesser light to rule the, the night, the moon, and he made the stars also. And of course, there's a huge amount of symbolism, not only in Christianity, but in other religions, linking the sun and stars and moon to gods, goddesses, and so on. Uh, the examples here from uh, the mausoleum of Galla Placidia in Ravenna, 5th century, and also Santa Ponarian Classe nearby, 
um, from a later date. But you can see here the stars are very stylized and symmetrical, and there's no attempt really to um, depict the heavens as they appeared. And so in the tradition, the Judeo-Christian art and architecture also um, carries on. And on the right, we've got an example of a manuscript from Hildegard of Bingen showing the six days of creation, which is covered with a, a starry sky in the background. And this, of course, was a manuscript which would probably have only been available to educated monks and nuns and the intelligentsia. Whereas on the left, we've got a, a mosaic from the cathedral in Monreal in Sicily of God creating the universe um, from the 12th century. And of course, these images would have been open to a very, very large congregation and are being used in a way as um, the, the book of the illiterate to, to show masses of people, the common people, as well as the educated ones, um, the idea of the creation and how important stars and the sky and the dark sky in particular were in that. So looking then back to, we can see from this population map how the population increases. And I think a correlation with the, um, with the, the light, the increasing light pollution is a valid one here, of course, but it's still very minimal by the 12th century. In St. Mark's in Venice, for example, we've got the Ascension Dome. And here we have in mosaic, Christ um, seated on, an, this is called an arc-en-ciel, the curved image in which he's sitting. Um, or it could actually be a, an attempt at showing the Milky Way, but again, showing um, the deity in, in the universe and the importance of the stars. And, and spirituality in all forms of religion, it, it comes through in, in Muslim and Hindu and other religions. Uh, it's not, not exclusive to the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. But by the, um, by the later Middle Ages, the science seems to have been increasing. And here in these two manuscripts, the Milky Way is actually depicted as a circle of stars, which is a very modern concept where you do actually have the galaxy as a, as a closed circle. And in the 12th century, um, these examples of, um, of um, the images in, depicted in manuscripts as, uh, of the Milky Way shows the Milky Way here as a circle. And this one, I think this is just absolutely uh, absolutely beautiful. This is from De Rerum Natura, which is a, a manuscript in, in Vienna, showing the, the monk's impression and inspiration of the stars in the Milky Way. This later example from the 14th century is particularly interesting. Again, the stars are still stylized, but they're not quite as symmetrical. There's more of a, an attempt to, um, to demonstrate that they were they are arranged not in symmetrical patterns. And the interesting thing here, I think, is the angels shown in an image uh, detail on the left. The angels are actually turning the sphere of the stars as it then was, um, cranking these handles um, to rotate the, series of the sphere of stars around the, the earth, which, however, is still de depicted as a flat earth in, in the middle in the form of what is known as a, a T and O map with Jerusalem at the center. Later on, we have more um, specific images of the Milky Way from this dream of, of Scipio. And the idea of that the Milky Way and the Milky Circle is the place where ancestors or spirits might end up. And then we come to um, the, the early Renaissance, where we've got Giotto's um, image of the ceiling in the Arena Chapel in Padua, and starry ceilings are, were very, very common in, um, in the Renaissance, Giotto being sort of proto or very early Renaissance. But you can see here from the detail on the right that the stars are completely stylized and done in, in regular lines in a very symmetrical pattern. So without any attempt to depict the sky sort of as is. Um, Chaucer, the English poet and, and writer in, in the 14th century, 
actually refers to the galaxy and the, gal the word galaxy, of course, is, is derived from the Greek word grala, grala, which means milk and that's where the name Milky Way comes from. And he also talks about, look, lo, the galaxy, which men clep call the Milky Way, for it is white. And so Chaucer in the 14th century would perceive, would be familiar with this white thing in the sky. Even the Sistine Chapel had a starry sky to start with, which we know from the image on the right, um, which um, before Michelangelo had, it, had a go at it and repainted the chapel, of course. But Michelangelo's um, image of, of the chapel, his images are very cosmic indeed. <clears throat> but the idea also comes through in literature, in Dante, the divine comedy in Paradiso. He talks about how he saw lovely things that the heavens hold and would come out once more to see the stars. And this is on the left, we have a drawing by Botticelli of an illustration to Dante's divine co um, comedy, which shows all the stars and the image of Christ as the sun in the center. In Shakespeare, Romeo, in Romeo and Juliet, it's evident. And Juliet actually asked that, that Shakespeare, that um, Romeo would be turned into stars so that all the world would be in love with night. And Shakespeare also um, refers to astrology, but, but sort of shooting it down because he said the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. In other words, it's, it's the idea of free will rather than fate. And this is also reflected in the Patsy Chapel in Florence in the mid 15th century, where we have here uh, a dome. That's a view from beneath of a dome where you can see that the stars are really accurately portrayed and you can pick out, <clears throat> for example, the bear, what, what um, in England is known as the plough, um, also known as the bear or the big dipper, and which in fact, uh, being so near London, um, is hardly visible at, at, at night. But an image that I, uh, an idea that I found very interesting, um, and quite recently too, was Shakespeare's King Lear. Now, I recently had the good fortune to go and see Sh King Shakespeare's King Lear performed at the Globe in, in London. And I was struck by how much astronomy and references to the, the dark skies there are in it. He talks about the eclipses of the sun and moon in act one. He, he mentions that the stars above govern us in Act Four. And then he also talks about smiting flat the thick rotundity of the world in Act Three, um, which shows that you know, the, the spherical Earth um, was, was accepted by then as opposed to the flat Earth, which um, is a, a subject of a whole, whole other discussion. But what it was particularly struck me in seeing Shakespeare's King Lear recently was that Shakespeare, as most of you probably know, um, quite often has a bit of light relief in some of his, his works. And he cracks jokes and he cracks a couple of jokes in, in the tragedy of King Lear. And one of the jokes, um, which follows on actually from a very silly joke about a snail carrying its house on its back. He poses, Shakespeare poses a riddle, the riddle and the riddle is, what is the reason why the seven stars are no more than seven? And the answer is because they're not eight. And he said, yes. Now, this is incredibly significant because it means that it's obviously a reference to the Pleiades, which is made of seven, seven stars that are visibly, visible easily. And Shakespeare would have known that his audience, some of whom were very educated and intelligentsia, but many were just common people, um, the person in the street, the ordinary people. And he knew that everybody would have been familiar with the Pleiades. Now the audience in London last summer um, probably didn't get the joke, whereas Shakespeare knew that his audience would get this jokey reference to the Pleiades constellation. Moving swiftly on, by the 16th century, we have um, images by Tintoretto, The Birth of the Milky Way, where the stars are still quite stylized. But by the time of Rubens, um, you can see that the starry background above this image is very much related to actual um, 
observation. And by then, of course, um, with the age of, of Galileo following on from Copernicus, we have the use of telescopes and so on. And this is all respect, reflected in art. So let's get back to the science now, just um, drawing to a close, that the population growth and lightning, lighting, if we look in 1417, there were the first organized lighting of the streets. It was actually a mayoral decree to light the bit of, to, for the streets of London to be lit in the early 15th century. And then not a great deal happened, but by the 1800s, there was more efficient coal fueled lighting, London's first gas lit road, in Baltimore, they were way ahead in lighting streets. Um, the first electric lights um, were in Paris in 1878, following on from street lighting as early as 1820. And then, of course, Thomas Edison invented the incandescent lamps, leading to light bulbs for street lighting. And you can see on the, on the right hand side how the, the population and exploration just gradually increased at this time. But still, oops, still in the um, in 1804, um, Wordsworth, I'm sure a lot of you know his poem about the daffodils, but it's not so well known perhaps that he describes the daffodils in the English Lake District as continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. So the Lake District now in England is still a good, a relatively good place to view, observe the stars. But shortly afterwards, Byron, um, Lord Byron um, wrote a poem about she walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry stars. And that was written in central London in 1814. But as the industrial revolution increases, we can see how the population increases and also the light pollution. By the 19th century, Van Gogh's work reflects the stars. And this is why it's so important that we do protect the night skies. Van Gogh shows here in, in two examples, the starry sky, which was done, and the idea that these spiral shapes should reflect spiral galaxies, which were being talked about at the time, or his image of the, the plow or the Great Bear Big Dipper and his image on the right. The Pre-Raphaelites here again in the late 19th century, we've got real constellations being depicted on the left here. And um, you can see how night with her train of stars, the idea of stars is something that was very caused a lot of interest as scientific advances happened in the, in the late 19th century. And now bringing up to the modern time. And of course here we've got, um, huge population increases in, in India and China, for example, and these don't necessarily anymore um, correspond with, with light pollution because um, some of these are very poor areas where there would not be so much light, but it's still, I think, valid as, a, as an indication until we get to the more recent years when actual mapping of actual light pollution, as shown by other other speakers is, is um, actually scientifically being done. And here is one of those. This is a, an actual light pollution um, image of, of Europe. And I'm, I'm actually sitting there under the great blob where, where London is. But still, we still have the inspiration of these astronomical phenomena, the, the love of the dark sky, such as Nelson's Milky Way. Um, this is written in relation to legends of a Central Australian tribe, the Walpiri, in, the, in Central Australia, where views are still um, excellent, of course. Or this um, wall hanging of, of the Milky Way, which is actually um, made of, of buttons sewn onto a tapestry. So in our modern age, um, you know, moving briefly on, this shows that really something has to be done about this. And the backstory to of this art history and the way that it's inspired artists. Our last speaker spoke about creativity inspired by the night sky. And now, of course, we have astrophotography and the image on the left is from the web telescope. And so just to finish off with, we've got these two fantastic images of Earthrise from the um, Apollo mission or the pale the famous pale blue dot 
um, which was taken of Earth. That is, that little dot is, is um, where we are um, in the midst of this immense universe. And this is why it is so important, I think, to, to be able to um, protect the dark skies and, and the inspiration and images that it, that it brings to all of us. I was recently in, in Maine, in the States, in a very small fishing village. And I just love this, um, this note that was pinned on the door of the fisherman's hut. We are all in this together. Um, we have to understand, we have to think about this together and do what we can to, um, to preserve the dark skies from light pollution. I haven't spoken about all the biology and the architectural lighting. I've really presented this as a as a sort of a backstory to what we need to to do to do now in this really important uh, issue. So thank you. I think I'm to time. And any questions? <laughs>